Hi everyone. It's a real pleasure to thank Andy and Phil for organizing this conference and for the opportunity to speak. It's a, an honor to be here today. The material that I want to talk about um, is joint work with Edward Kroc and centers around a few related concepts concerning lacunarity, Kakea typesets, and directional maximal operators. So here's a plan. I'll start out by providing some background and context on um, about the questions that are we, that we are, will be considering leading up to the statement of the problem. Now the word lacunarity is a very um, well-defined meaning in dimension one. So I will review those definitions for us. And then on in the process also indicate what the challenges are in extending these notions to higher dimensions. And I'll tell you what the de our working definitions are and what uh, results we obtain from them. And then at the very end, if I'm really lucky, I'll get to a brief overview of the proof. So let's get started. Um, I promised to talk about Kakea type sets. So maybe a good place to start would be by recalling what the Kakea set is. A Kakea basic homage set is by definition one that contains a unit line segment in every direction. So the study of such sets uh, spans approximately a century and it has been an intensely fruitful, if at times vexing endeavor. There are some long-standing open questions still in the field of which I will not, I'll not go into that direction at all. However, suffice it to say, that the whole investigation um, started from a classical result of Besikovich back in 1928. He established that there exist Kakea sets of zero Lebesgue measure. So Besikovich's original construction relied on this procedure involved transfer of triangles. And that procedure has been refined in many different directions. One of the most streamlined versions that has, that's available to date, so I'm going to um, refer to it as, a fe as the feature of stickiness. Um, the word is not my coinage, by the way. It, there, is a, there is actually a property called sticky in the literature. <laughs> so, but you will see in a second why it's called uh, the feature of stickiness. So this is a property of a Besikovich type construction in R2. For example, uh, Big Stein has a very nice position of it. So it does the following. Fix any positive epsilon. Then you can find an integer capital N and a bunch of rectangles of dimensions 1 by 2 to the power of minus N, all pointing in different 2 to the minus N separated directions with the following feature, that if you look at these rectangles by themselves, they have an enormous overlap. So that when you look at the unions of these rectangles, their area is smaller than this prefixed epsilon. On the other hand, if you look at what's called known as the reach of these rectangles, then they spring apart and become disjoint. So what exactly is the reach of a rectangle? It's the rectangle with the and orientation as the original one, except that it is translated along its axis by So just to have a picture in mind, if this is PT, this is 1, and this is 2 to the minus n. And um, so you move, move one unit and two units. So this, is, this would be your. PT tilde. So the whole point of this is that the PT tildes are all pairwise disjoint, and the PTs are most definitely not. OK. All right. So obviously, the existence of such families of rectangles implies the existence of two-dimensional Kakea sets of arbitrarily small measure. And it's 
feature of stickiness that has found repeated applications in deep and diverse corners of analysis. Fundamental results have relied on the existence of a sticky collection of rectangles. So two cases in point, one would be a result that um, Alex touched upon this morning. For example, if you look at the collection of all parallelopipeds of arbitrary dimension and orientation, it's well known that such families are truly awful in terms of differentiation properties. They do not differentiate any non-trivial Lebesgue space. So the proof of that fact relies on the existence of a sticky collection of rectangles. Another celebrated example is uh, due to Charles Pfefferman on the, for the counter of the ball multiplier. OK, so it's this phenomenon of stickiness that we would like to extend to higher dimensions in some meaningful way with some potential applications in mind. Wait a minute. OK, so here's some uh, preliminary definition. For us, a set of directions omega is a relatively compact subset of Rd plus 1, excluding the origin. A tube is a cylinder with circular cross-section, with the radius of the cross-section typically much smaller than the length. We'll say that a tube has orientation omega if the axis of the cylinder is parallel to the vector omega. And a delta tube is, by definition, a tube of unit length and cross-sectional radius delta much smaller than 1. OK, so with, equipped with all of this, I think we are ready for our definition of a Kakeya type set. So we'll say that a direction set omega admits Kakeya type sets if there is an absolute constant C0 with the following property. Choose any integer n. Then I can find a collection of delta tubes, and the delta depends on n, with each of these tubes has to be oriented in from some direction that comes from omega. Okay? And now you are going to look at two sets. One is En, that's simply the union of the collections of these tubes. And the other one is En star, which you should think of as roughly something that encodes the reach. Not exactly, sort of. So with the property that when you look at the ratio of their respective volumes, that ratio En star to En goes to infinity and goes to infinity. So in other words, uh, there is a real disparity in size between the translated versions and the original versions. And what is En star? En star consists also of delta t of, of tubes. And the, the tubes, that are con the constituent tubes of E and star, I have denoted them by C0 PT, where PTs are the original ones. C0 PT is a, is a C0 dilate of the original tube, except that the dilations only take place along the axes. And the orientation, the cross-section radius remain unchanged. Okay? So, all right. So if such, uh, if you get have such sets, then these sets ENs will be called, will be said to be of Kakeya type for obvious reasons because these are sets which have direction also, and they have this sort of uh, stickiness feature that EN star and EN have very different volumes. Okay, so here's a question of interest. What are the direction sets omega that admit Kakeya type sets? Okay. So what is known? Now it's this. The answer to this question is uh, well understood. Dimension two, largely due to the work of Bateman, building upon earlier work of Bateman and Katz, and also Alfonseca, Alfonseca, Soria, and Varga. And the answer, the core concept here turns out to be something called lacunarity. And I'm going to describe what that means uh, very soon. But it's much less clear what this word lacunarity even means in higher dimensions and whether what such a notion might have to do with the admittance of Kakeya sets. OK, so maybe a good, uh, a good place now would be to talk about what do I mean by lacunarity. If you are trying 
understand direction sets in R2, you need to think about lacunarity in R. Well, why is that? That's because if, we, if you look at the direction set in R2, it looks like cos theta sine theta, theta being the slope. So you, have, you need this one parameter to specify a direction. And when I talk about lacunarity, it's lacunarity in theta. Okay? All right. So we are going to say that an infinite sequence A consisting of the elements AJs is a lacunary sequence with lacunarity constant at most lambda converging to a limit alpha if take any two consecutive elements of the sequence find their distances from the limit point alpha, the ratio of these two distances has to be uniformly bounded above by lambda. In other words, a lacunary sequence by its very nature cannot have decay slower than geometric decay. Okay? All right. So we are going to use a lacunary sequence as a building block to define a lacunary set. All right, so I'm going to denote by capital lambda of n the collection of lacunary sets on the real line of order at most n. And there is another parameter, little lambda, which captures what I call the lacunarity, the degree of lacunarity. Okay? So in R, a lacunary set of order 0 is either empty or a single time. And you build up a lacunary set of order n recursively, as follows. So the way you should think about it is that a lacunary set of order n is built up of strata. And the demarcating points of the strata would be a lacunary sequence. And each stratum is going to be a lacunary set of lower. So that's how you think about it. So I'm going to draw a picture. You're going to say, that a set U, a relatively compact subset U of the real line is lacunary of order N. If I can find a lacunary sequence, capital A, with the following property, if you take any two elements, A consecutive elements, A and B in that lacunary sequence, and restrict attention to the portion of U that falls inside this interval, then that portion is lacunary of order at most n minus 1. Okay? So that's the definition of lacunarity in um, dimension 1. And um, a set U which is, cannot be covered by a finite union of lacunary sets of finite order, we are going to deem it sublacunary. So maybe some quick examples. So some of the easy geometric um, sequences, like 2 to the minus j, it's lacunary of order 1. And lacunarity a constant lambda is 1 half. Um, if you want to build up, so rough, the way you should think about it in your head is you have a lacunary sequence that's lacunary of order 1. If you think of a set where each point of that sequence is the limit point of lacunary sequences that would give you something that is lacunary of order 2. So 2 to the minus j plus 3 to the minus k is kind of a prototypical example. 2 to the minus j itself is a lacunary sequence and plus 3 to the minus k is just converged to it. So that's lacunary of order 2. On the other hand, if you look at the sequence 1 over j, that's obviously not lacunary, and if you take sets that are more dense, for example, if you look at, say, the collection of all dyadic rationals, that is definitely sublacunary. All right. So now, the harmonic analysts in the audience are not even going to be a tiny bit surprised if I say that behind this analysis, there are two maximal operators. Um, maximal operators seem to pervade this whole theory. And I'll, I'm going to give you two instances, which uh, kind of drive is kind of a driving force behind this, this, the, the circle of problems that I'm discussing today. So I'm going to talk about the directional maximal operator and a Nicodem type maximal operator. So remember, omega still denotes our direction set. The directional maximal operator d omega acting on f evaluated at a point x is the maximum of the averages of absolute value of f 
where the supremum is taken over straight lines of finite but arbitrary length centered at the point x, but the orientation of the straight lines have to come from omega. Okay. And a similar object is this Kakea Nikuti maximal operator, which I've denoted by m sub omega. Once again, it's a maximal average, but here the soup is over tubes. And the tubes have to contain the point x, have to be oriented in uh, a direction from omega. Okay. All right. So what exactly do these maximal operators have to contribute to the discussion and at hand about the admittance of Kakea type sets or the lacunarity in general? Okay. So that's th this, that this slide is devoted to that. Um, so suppose you look at sort of the granddaddy of all direction sets. The omega is the unit sphere. That's about as big as it is. It's a consequence of the existence of Kakea type sets that d of omega, m of omega, when m is when omega is S D, is unbounded every non-trivial Lebesgue space. Okay? And and the, the reason is the existence of Kakea sets of measure zero. Now, more generally, if omega admits Kakea type sets defined in our sense from earlier, even then we can make the same type of conclusion. Any set direction set omega that admits Kakea type sets will automatically give rise to unbounded directional and type maximal operators, unbounded on every single level space except infinity. OK, why is that? So this is probably going to be the only proof for the day. So let me um, spend a little bit of time on it. You see, if it so turns out that you have a Kakea, uh, bunch of Kakea type sets, all you would need to do is you need to pick a point x that belongs to E n star. For every point in E n star, there would be a straight line that originates in x and, and this will be a finite line segment which spends a positive proportion of its length in En. And that is enough to conclude that the directional maximal operator evaluated at x is uniformly bounded away from 0 for L on En star. And that gives you a lower bound on the LP operator norm of d omega. And the LP operator norm is simply a ratio of En star over En raised to an appropriate exponent. By the definition of a Kakea type set, um, this, ratio, this ratio goes to infinity. All right. Now, of course, that begs the question that having a Kakea type sets is bad for a boundedness of the directional maximal operator. Do we, what happens if, well, suppose you don't have Kakea type sets? Is that good? Do we know that the directional operators are bounded in that case? That's a natural question. Okay? So, in a, another way of saying the same thing is that for, when omega is at all of the unit sphere, then of course we have unboundedness. If we take a smaller omega, the maximal operator shrinks, it actually has a fighting chance now of being bounded. Okay. So, so the question is, since D sub SD and M sub SD are unbounded, do there exist small sets of directions omega for which these operators are bounded on some LP? And there is an extensive literature in the, based in the positive direction. I have highlighted a few names here. Um, the pioneering work in this direction started with a paper of um, Nagelstein and Winger in 1978. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about what all these different steps have taken us to the logical survey of this um, of this of these problems okay all right so here are some po some details of the positive results where the directional maximal operators are known to be bounded and not just bounded bounded in the in the full range e from 1 to infinity excluding p equals 1 all right. So the first example, as I said, is due to um, Alex Nagel, um, Eli Stein, and Stephen Winger. 
and the direction sets omega that they consider are of the following type. It's essentially a one parameter family indexed by a lacunary sequence. So vi is a lacunary sequence with lacunary constant lambda and the vi's without loss of generality can go to zero. So you concoct your direction set by looking at appropriate powers of vi and creating a d plus one dimensional vector out of it. So these powers that you pick, a1 through a d plus one, these are fixed throughout. So the only thing that varies are the i's, okay? And then when you show that d omega is bounded on all of the Lebesgue spaces, okay? Shortly thereafter, in, it was in 1981, Chabrin and Chalene extended this in the planar setting in R2 to direction sets that they called lacunary of finite order. And Carberry in 1988 extended it in yet another direction by looking at direction sets which are essentially Cartesian products of a geometric sequence. So, Unlike the Nagel-Stein-Winger example, which is one parameter, Carberry's example is a d-parameter uh, family in terms of the number of free variables. Okay? And much more recently, Parsett and Rogers in 2013 have um, made a much more general definition of what they call direction sets that are lacunary of finite order in their sense. And under that hypothesis, they have once again shown that the directional maximal operators are FP bounded for all P. All right, so now let's move over to the flip side of the coin again. So d omega, there are some genuinely non-trivial omegas for which d omega is bounded. And there are, again, some genuinely non-trivial omegas for which they are not. So I'm going to mention two results which are kind of fundamental and representative. One of them is a result of Bateman and Katz um, from 2008, where they look at the direction set where the slopes are given by the points of the standard Cantor middle plane that such a set of directions is actually, that the set of directions admits Kakea type sets, and admitting Kakea type sets, of course, gives rise to unbounded directional maximal operators, okay? Yet another example, perhaps initially very counterintuitive, appears in this paper of Parsett and Rogers that I talked about, where they give an example in general dimensions. I have only quoted it in R3, but their, their uh, example works in all dimensions, where they give another example of direction set with unbounded directional and Kakea type maximal operators. Now, why do I say this is initially counterintuitive? Well, what's that example? So suppose you take a non-trivial interval centered at one, say, and you pick an enumerate on that interval, and you call that enumeration QL. So for QL, you now create this direction set, which is QL times 2 to the minus L, comma 2 to the minus L, comma 1. Now, if you looked at the one-dimensional coordinate projections of this vector, they are lacunary sequences. Each, every one-dimensional coordinate projection is a lacunary sequence, and so somehow intuition would suggest something that has this much lacunarity should be LP bounded at least on some P, and whereas Parsett and Rogers show by furnishing a class of test functions, they don't show that the class of test functions that they generate from sets of Kakea type, nonetheless, by a different kind of mechanism, they show that um, this this collection gives rise to unbounded directional and Kakea type maximal operators. Okay, so, so something is going on here. And what I think we would like to do is try to get our finger on what is the characterizing feature in general dimensions that decides whether you are going to have a Kakea type set or not, and also in the hopefully in that process gives rise to bounded directional maximal operators or not. Okay, now I should spend some time, I already indicated to you that the answer is well understood in dimension two, so I want to talk about what is known in dimension two. 
in dimension two, there is the combined uh, result force of the results of Alfonseca and Bateman is that it gives a complete characterization of the property of admittance of Kakea type sets. And it does so really dramatically be, by saying that the three notions that I have introduced thus far are equivalent. So in other words, the property of d omega being unbounded on every Lebesgue space is equivalent to omega admitting Kakea type sets. And that, in turn, is equivalent to the slope set being a finite union of lacunary sets of finite order. And not only that, if omega fails any, and therefore each one of these um, conditions, then d omega is not just bounded on some LP, it is actually bounded on all LP, giving rise to the interesting dichotomy that you can never have a directional maximum operator which is bounded on part of the range and unbounded on some others. Okay. All right. So here are a few um, distinctive features of the work of uh, Bateman. It gives a complete characterization of the LP boundedness of d omega and m omega in the plane, while also describing all direction sets that admit planar sets of Kakea type. And a new direction of this work was that it relied on encoding the slope set as a tree, in his case, a dyadic tree. And he, he managed to relate the notion of sublacunarity with he called a large splitting number of that tree. Okay? And finally, the actual um, proof that you have, uh, you have Kakea type sets relied on the probabilistic counter construction of, of a certain counterexample, which exploits the property of stickiness relative to the tree, and also, of course, the structure of the tree. So if, um, if, I, if I have time, I'll get around to saying more on this. OK, but moving on, how do, we, how do we go about extending the notion of lacunarity in higher dimensions? And there is, of course, a number of naive approaches that we could consider. After all, if you have a direction set, one could say, look at all the coordinate projections. If all the coordinate projections are lacunary of finite order, you declare your set to be lacunary of finite order. I mean, that would be one of the first things to consider. Unfortunately, there is a serious obstacle to this. And in order to just sort of point out where the obstacle is, here's an example. So I'm going to give you an example of two lacunary sets on the real line, both of which are lacunary of order one. But when you take their set algebraic sum, the set algebraic sum becomes sublacunary. So here's the example. Suppose you choose a fast growing sequence NJ and a slower growing one MJ. Okay, so if you just want to fix ideas, you can pick NJ and MJ to be like that. So what we do now is you fix a J, and for every K between one and MJ, I'm going to define a bunch of rationals q, j, k. And if you, this, I don't know if this expression looks a bit forbidding, but the way to think about it is it's just an affine copy of the dyadic rationals between 0 and 1 which of, with a fixed denominator, capital MJ. That's all that is, that, that it really is. Okay? Now, I'm going to define my set, u, j, as 2 to the minus n, j plus k plus a little shift, and the qjk is going to be this little shift. OK? All right. And u is the, simply the union of the uj's. So the way to think about this is here we have a whole bunch of these dyadic um, intervals. And each one of them, or maybe some of them, is, they are going, you are going to have a point here, and a point there, and a point here. And the union of this is simply going to be your u. Okay. Then, so these give you the u's. What are the v's? So that this somewhere here is 0. v lives on the other side. So this is simply negative 2 to the minus j. So this is very easy to understand. So the whole point is you cannot get more lacunary than this, because 
you could pick on, of course, this is already lacunary as you can very well see. And here, if, if you take 2 to the minus nj plus k and 2 to the minus nj plus k plus 1, which is itself a lacunary sequence, any two consecutive members of the sequence straddle at most one point. So, of course, by our definition, it is lacunary of order 1. And yet, when you add them up and you look at u plus v, see what happens. What happens is that the 2 to the minus nj plus k is going to cancel out with one of these guys and end up with a big pileup of a whole bunch of qjks all in one interval. So what u plus v does is that u plus v contains for every j an affine copy of these dyadic rationals. And such a set has to be sublacunary. So what's the problem? The problem is that if you now look at this two-dimensional set, u cross v, where that is u and v, then I would like to call such a set finite order. Because if I don't, well, it's after all, the one-dimensional coordinate projections are lacunary of finite order. And yet, look what happens when I somehow recast the same set under a different coordinate system, phi, where phi of u comma v is u plus v comma u, mi u minus v. Suddenly, in that coordinate system, my lovely set has become sublacunary. So the whole moral of the story is this lacunarity is extremely any higher dimensional extension that you might wish to consider has to factor in the phenomenon that lacunarity, if you just look at one dimensional coordinate projections in a fixed set of coordinates, might completely turn the tables on you in a different coordinate system. OK. All right, so that's the main inspiration of the definition that I'm going to um, say right now. Suppose you are in Rn. And let V be a d-dimensional affine subspace of uh, Rn. You fix a base point A in V and an orthonormal basis B of V minus A. And given this pair, A comma B, you define the projection maps phi here in the most natural way. If you take a point x in your, in your affine subspace, and you write, it, write x minus a as a linear combination of the vj's, then the jth coefficient is simply called the jth projection of x. Okay? Now, the definition of an admissible lacunary Euclidean set is one where we insist that we have, we not just have lacunarity in certain coordinate projections, but uniformly in all coordinate projections. In other words, what I would like to say is that we say that u is admissible lacunary of order at most n if I can find an integer r such that for any choice of basis and base point, if you look at the coordinate projections, each one dimensional coordinate projection can be covered uniformly by R members of one dimensional lacunary sets of order at most n. So that's, that's the definition. And this set is called sublacunary if it is not admissible lacunary of finite order. OK. So of course, that's the definition. It would be good to make sure that it's not vacuous. So um, the first thing we do is we check the sets that Nagel, Stein, Wenger, and Carberry uh, work with um, as Euclidean sets. I'm going to go to direction sets in, a, in a, a minute, because you see, Euclidean sets and direction sets are not quite the same, because direction sets allow for some scale invariance, which Euclidean sets do not have. So anyway, but as Euclidean sets, the Nagel, Stein, Wenger set is lacunary of order 1. The Carberry set, which is essentially is a product of d copies of um, geometric sequences, that's um, lacunary of order d. And if you take an example like the u and the v, like I, like I constructed in the slide before, then u cross v is actually sublacunary. Okay? 
All right, so now, as I said, Euclidean sets and direction sets are obviously related, but are not identical. Because you could take a collection of vectors, scale each one by an arbitrary amount, leave the direction set uh, the item unchanged, and create havoc as a Euclidean set. Okay, so, uh, so what, what exactly do I mean by a direction set? So we define an equivalence relation, two sets of direction sets with restricted unit sphere, they are the same set. So a direction set is an equivalence class of this relation. And when I, loosely speaking, talk about omega being a direction set, what I really mean is the equivalence class containing omega. Okay. Now, to bring everything down, all possible representatives of a direction set down to the same footing, I'm going to define a direction cone, which is the, simply the cone of direction generated by the vectors in omega. Okay. So I'm going to define now what I mean by finite order lacularity of direction sets. Okay. So once again, you fix a capital N, you fix a lacunarity constant lambda. You say that omega is admissible lacunary as a direction set if for any hyperplane at unit distance from the origin, if you intersect the direction cone with that hyperplane, that resulting set is going to be Euclidean as a Euclidean set admissible at order at most 10, and in fact coverable by a fixed constant R of Euclidean lacunary sets. And this has to happen uniformly across all hyperplanes. N, R, and lambda have to stay fixed. Okay? All right. So a direction set omega that fails this property will be called a sub-lacunary direction set. So, so to just... Uh, to um, emphasize what the definition means is that no matter if, if an omega is sublacunary, then no matter what n, r, and lambda you might choose, I will be able to provide for you a hyperplane. And in that hyperplane, I will be able to hand you a lot that the restriction of the direction cone on that hyperplane when projected on that line will fail to be covered by R members of lacunary sets of order n. That's what it means. So there are many different things floating around here. There are all these hyperplanes in many different directions. But even when you have restricted to the hyperplane, recall that the definition of Euclidean lacunarity requires you to project in all different directions within that hyperplane. So every, it has to be uniform in everything. OK, so some example. Um, the Nagelstein-Winger example and the Carberry examples continue to be admissible lacunary of finite order with the same uh, orders as direction sets. And if you create a direction set out of u cross v, let's say 1 comma u comma v, then such a set is sub-lacunary as a direction set. Probably more to the point is that if you look at the example of Parsett and Rogers that I talked about, where that is actually sublacunary as a direction set. Why is that sublacunary? Well, look at the cone generated by omega and slash with the hyperplane x2 equals 1. If you slash with the hyperplane x2 equals 1, what you get, this direction set, this direct, these vectors become QL1, 2 to the L. And when you take that vector and you project it in the x1 direction, you get an enumeration of the rationals QL, and that I have already discussed is sublacunary. OK. So what do our results say? So we, we, we say that if d is bigger than or equal to 2, then, and if we assume that our direction set omega is sublacunary in rd plus 1 in the sense that I have described thus far, then omega admits Kakea type sets. So that's our main result. And as I have said already, there is also a body of work in, in the opposite direction. So if we take into account the state of the art knowledge as of now, what we have is a characterization of um, 
these three concepts of lacunarity, admittance of Kakea type sets, and boundedness or unboundedness of the direction of maximal operators in all dimensions. So the following are equival uh, equivalent. A direction set omega is sublacunary if and only if the set of directions omega admit Kakea type sets. And that is if and only if the maximal operators d omega and m omega are unbounded on all LP. Just as in the two-dimensional situation, if they are not unbounded on every LP, they have to be bounded on every LP. Okay. So I'd better point out, so a number of people's uh, work have gone into this. So for example, in dimension d equal to 1, 1 implies 2 is due to Bateman. 2 implies 3, it's an easy argument, which I have already told you. It's well known in the literature. 3 implies 1 is due to Alfonseca, building on earlier work of Alfonseca, Soria Vargas, uh, Nagel, Steinwenger, Carberry, uh, Shugrain, and Shelley. For d bigger than or equal to 2, um, 1 implies 2 is the theorem that we have claimed. Uh, 2 implies 3 is still easy. And 3 implies 1 is essentially Parsett and Rogers. OK, so I think what I'll do is um, I have very little time to spend on the details of the proof. But um, in the few minutes that I have left, what I will try to do is I will try to highlight some of the main features and try to, to at least give you an idea of what was new, what was old and what was new. Okay? So, so one critical ingredient in the proof was encoding certain representatives of the direction set as trees. So this feature, as I mentioned before, already appeared in the work of Bateman and Katz, and also in a big way in the work of Bateman, which they did. So in, however, in our case, we have to look at the representatives of the direction sets so the representatives that I'm talking about here are the intersections of the direction cones with all the hyperplates. So we need to look at tree encodings of these sets. And as I mentioned, even these tree encodings are wildly sensitive to the coordinate in which you are representing um, the tree. So what exactly do I mean by a tree representation? So here's, here's what I mean. So let me just give you a very easy one-dimensional example. So suppose your omega is, let's say, okay, I'm just going to uh, say what a, just say what a tree representation is in one dimension. Okay, so what happens is you look at, let's say we, we decide to do it in base two. So you always start out, the root of your tree is going to be the zero to one. So that's your root vertex. Okay. Now, the, at the second stage, this is generation 0. At the second stage, this root splits into two children, one of which is 0 half, and the other one is half 1. Okay. 0 half now gives rise to two children, and half 1 gives rise to two more children. Each one represents a dyadic interval of length 1 quarter. So this gives you a full binary tree. And notice that every point in 0, 1 is identifiable by a unique infinite ray in this tree. And, if you, and the tree that when I talk about a tree encoding omega, I simply mean the collection of all rays that lead to the points here. So for example, in this case, So the tree encoding omega would look like this. OK? So this would represent half. This would represent 1 quarter, 1 eighth. This would represent 0, the limit point. OK? 
All right, so this is what happens in one dimension. Of course, if now your omega is a two-dimensional set, this vertex is going to become not just an interval, but a cube. Okay? And it is now going to depend on how, what coordinates you are using to represent points in omega. That's what I meant by saying it's co coordinate sensitive. And then, once again, I relate sublacunarity to the large splitting number of some representative direction tree, much in the way that Bateman does. The direction tree has to be pruned so as to extract some structural information out of it. So we call it pruning of the direction tree. And finally, again, true to the skeletal framework that's, uh, that's created by Bateman and Bateman cats, we construct a probabilistically a random family of tubes using the tree structure of the direction set as the basis of a slope assignment mechanism. Okay. Now finally, once we have created a random family of tubes, we have to show that with large probability, the union of such a collection of tubes gives rise to a Kakea type set. That's, that's the main feature. And it's really at this very last stage that some of the new ideas that have crept in. So one of the things in this part of this verifi probabilistic verification of the existence of Kakea typesets, what we are led to consider are the different configurations groups of the tubes that give rise to certain intersections. In order to make a claim that there is parity in size between tubes in one part and their extensions in another part, you really have to understand how these tubes intersect. And in order to understand how tubes intersect, you have to understand how their roots and slopes are related to each other. And it's really the analysis of these root configurations that we think is the contribution that we have made. I think this is a good time to stop. Thank you. Any questions from Malabiga? I have a question. In the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, the lack of arity in higher dimensions was not that well understood, or there was, you know, we see this. It seems to me that the, with your theorem, it really closes the loop. So it clo of course, it closes the loop maybe as far as this direction goes, but it sort of opens up a huge number of other questions. So for example, even in, so if one, one can now ask a lot more refined questions about if you have a sub-lacunary direction set in general dimensions, you don't, of course, we now know it's no good looking at the directional maximal operator that's unbounded and so on, but it is still possible to look at delta tubes with a maximal operator that's now indexed by delta and ask how does such a maximal operator's LP norm blow up or decay or do whatever in terms of, del in terms of delta. And surely that has to, that exponent of delta, if it's algebraic, I'm guessing, would have something to do with the order of lacunarity, which we completely don't understand. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Marlon again.